There you go. Push the intro. Hey, 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 welcome to the Seth Joyner Show presented by Bet Parks. A lot to get to tonight. Um, no whiteboard. We're just going to chop it up tonight and talk about what's going on with these Eagles. And I'm going to preview for you NFC AFC Championship games coming up um, on Sunday. Um, the much anticipated press conference yesterday was really didn't meet expectation. Um, I think everybody was excited to see what Howard Roseman and Nick Sirianni had to say. And as I sat in my car and listened to the entire press conference, you know, to me, they didn't really have a whole lot of anything to say. Um, there are some things that are, you know, pretty shocking to me. Um, starting with the retention of Nick Sirianni. I guess, you know, as time went on, I, I think we kind of understood that that was the direction that we were headed. But when I consider you fired your offensive coordinator, you fired your defensive coordinator, and you fired your defensive consultant. Now, all... Three of these men, Howie Roseman and Nick Sirianni, has said that Nick hired these guys, okay? My question is, if he hired those guys, how can you trust him to come back this year and hire new coordinators and expect success to be imminent? All season long, there was no remedy for the offensive side of the football. And that's Nick Sirianni's baby. He's supposed to be an offensive guru, yet they had no remedy for the inconsistency, the inefficiency, you know, the consistency on any level. I mean, all season long, we were waiting for this football team to kind of figure it out on the offensive side of the football team. Listen, this, this, this offense is too good. They got too many weapons to play the game the way that they play the game, to be as ineffective as they are. And Nick Sirianni had no remedy whatsoever. Um, 19 weeks. They talked about getting it right for 19 weeks. And the most damning thing for me was in the midst of this humble role that they were on they couldn't figure it out and nick had no answer an immediate personality asked him you know hey coach you know you think you can figure it out you think you can get the team turned around and his answer to my amazement was don't you think if i knew what the answer was how to figure it out that i would have done so by now like, I was astonished, absolutely 100% astonished that he would answer that question in that vein. So my biggest question mark about Nick Sirianni is that if he couldn't figure it out this year, and I know that Vic Fangio is coming on board. I'll have some comments about that in a second. What if your defensive coordinator can't figure it out? this next season what if offensively you fall into a rut and you can't fix it next year now the ceo because he's not going to be calling plays well i think we're all waiting 
trying to figure out who the offensive coordinator is going to be. But if you bring in an offensive coordinator and you've stated that you're going to give him control and you're going to oversee everything, when things go awry as a CEO, you have to have an answer. And if Nick didn't have an answer this year, my greatest question is, how is he going to have an answer next year when adversity hits? And it's surely going to hit. What's your answer? The team started off 10 and 1 and then went 1 and 6 over the last seven games of the season. All because we had a coaching staff. They couldn't figure out how to remedy, how to take this Ferrari of an offense and get it from driving like a VW bug to driving like the Ferrari that it was. The frustration was evident by the players. And let me ask you a question because I got into a conversation with somebody today and it was like, well, you know, a guy like Fletcher Cox came to his defense and Hey, listen, man, don't you think Fletcher Cox wants to come back here? Don't you think the players understand that there's going to be massive change across the board in the personnel in this football team? And if you talk bad about the guy that they could potentially bring back, that means your ass ain't coming back. So you're going to say all the right things. But this is a right now business. The Eagles window. Let, let, let me share this, this ideal with you. And you guys tell me what you think. I'm going to jump over in the comment section a little bit, you know, and kind of look at some of what you guys are saying. But take just consider this. If the Eagles can get out from under Jalen Hurts' contract, after next season. That's the way they structured. They structured it in a way where it was team friendly from a stand, from a cap standpoint. The hits are minimal in comparison to other quarterbacks. Okay? And don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that this is what could happen. But I'm trying to throw out to you guys some hypotheticals when it's, when it's all said and done. Okay? Let me give you a, a glance into the window of, you know, Time that this football team has to win because every football team has a window to win. And when that window closes, there's going to be massive change that has to happen in order for you to reset and get back to a place where you can build to get back to the top of the hill again. Jalen Hurts' contract. The Eagles can get out from under that contract after next season. Okay. So if this thing implodes, if this thing falls apart, consider this. Jalen Hurts could potentially not be here. You're in a rebuild on the offensive side of the ball because you certainly are going to have to ask, you know, A.J. Brown maybe to consider restructuring in order to keep him here, which is doable. But if you have another offensive year like you had last year, next year, you think Devontae Smith wants to be here? You're talking about a guy who laid it on the line. He poured out all 165 pounds that he had in that last game. He gave it all. And for the most part this season, he went through it and didn't bitch or complain about anything. I began to see Dallas Goddard get get frustrated at the end of the season. You think that Dallas Goddard wants to sign another long-term contract to play here? When he's averaging 40-something, 50-something catches a year, and he knows that he has the potential to be one of the top, if not the top tight end in the National Football League. And because you have a wide receiver one and a wide receiver 1A, 
that you're not going to get any more than five, six targets a game at the max. Sometimes you only get two or three. You think Dallas God is going to want to come back and waste the prime years of his career in a situation that's not feasible for him? Now, when you're winning, winning covers everything. Because that's what players play the game for. But when you ain't winning, it's hard, extremely hard for the player to lay it all on the line. When they look at the situation and the system and realize that I'm giving it all, but I can't, I'm not benefiting from it. So if I'm not benefiting from it, there's certainly a team out there they will want to bring me in and make it beneficial for me. So I'm telling you guys to look at it from that standpoint, that this window that the Philadelphia Eagles are in, it's not going to stay open forever. Um, and this is why I'm surprised, because you know you got to hurry up and get it done. You got to hurry up and get it back. And I get it, the likelihood of them going to the Super Bowl in one year and getting back to the other, it's it's tough, okay? But when you look at how this thing imploded down the stretch, you got to ask yourself, is Nick Sirianni the guy to turn this thing around? The other part is, you know, as I'm listening to his press conference yesterday, Nick Sirianni seems like, it sounds like to me, he's got all of his authority has been stripped. The way he talked, hey, listen, we're going to bring in a defensive coordinator, okay? Vic Fangio's coming in. Nick Sirianni's not going to be able to tell Vic Fangio what to do. Vic Fangio already runs a system that the organization feels as though it is the way that football should be played. Then, but don't break, be aggressive in the red zone. Tired of seeing it. I'll address that in a minute. Going to bring in an offensive coordinator, and I'm waiting with bated breath to kind of see what's that going to look like, okay? So he's not going to be calling any plays. The defensive coordinator is going to be in total control, okay? And someone asked Nick, what are you, okay, what are you going to do if the coordinators are going to be doing everything? Well, I'm going to be the culture guy. I'm going to set the culture over here and set the culture over there. Let me tell you guys something about culture. Because culture only comes up. It only comes up and comes into question when a team is either winning at a high clip because all the culture is just great, or it comes up when a team is playing like crap, and they're losing football games. Oh, the culture's bad. That's why. Let me tell you, winning takes care of culture. Because when you're winning, players are doing things the right way. They're saying the right things. They're taking care of each other the right way. The coaches are doing things the right way. If you want to have good culture, be a winning football team. Because when you're getting your ass kicked from week to week, and you lose five out of the last six games after starting off at 10 and one, your culture goes out the door. Because everybody's questioning everything that goes on around you. And then you got all these little factions that break out on the football team. You know, a wide receiver or two are, they're huddled up talking about the quarterback because I'm running wire open down the field and he don't even see me. That's the first part. Quarterback ain't getting the ball out on time. We up here blocking our asses off, and he holding on to the ball. That's the other part. Man, I'm tired of running these routes out here and not getting any targets. You know, I'm a running back. How come they ain't feeding me the ball? That's another piece. Culture breakers. On the defensive side of the ball, you made a massive mistake by finding Sean Desai, making him the fall guy for why things wasn't working, and then turning around and giving Matt Patricia the reins 
and watching him make the defense worse than it was. You had guys on Matt Patricia's side. You had guys on Sean Desai's side. I'm sure Sean Desai is sitting there looking and laughing his ass off at what Matt Patricia was trying to do. And you got Desai's guys. It's like, man, what the hell are we trying to run with, with, with Coach, Coach Patricia? Guys on Patricia's side that are like, man, I'm glad we made this change. Because what Sean Desai was doing, you see how they fractured this thing and how they broke the culture? So don't talk to me about this culture guy that's going to, you know, make everything right while everybody else is doing everything else. Because the only thing that makes culture right is when. Because people have a tendency to bitch and complain when they ain't winning. And they point the finger and find a reason why everybody else, why, why the team is losing. And that falls on culture. That ain't nothing but the truth. Because did you hear anything about culture last year when this team was on their roll? No. Why? Because they were winning. Now we want to talk about culture because they got their ass kicked the last seven games of the season. Their soul stolen, you know, against a team like the 49ers, which sets, set the stage for all of them. So what have they done with Nick Sirianni? As a player, how do you view him? As a guy who's had all of his authority stripped, who do you look at as the authority figure? And have the Philadelphia Eagles, have Howie Roseman and, and Jeffrey Lurie set Nick, set Nick Sirianni up to lose and to be the fall guy? Because when everything goes sideways, and everybody, all these coaches are out of here. Guess who's still going to be here? Jeffrey Lurie, because he's the owner. And Howie Roseman. They're going to be here. These coaches are going to be gone. And they're going to think because they've had success over the last six years, two Super Bowls in the last six years, that their process and how they've been doing business is the right way to do it. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because I got Howard Roseman down here on my list too. So what's the benefit of bringing Nick Sirianni back? The only one that I can see is that there's some continuity, you know, from – we got a guy who the players know, don't know whether they believe him in him or not. I heard a a, a, venture, a very interesting um, bit of information on Jeffrey Lurie that the last two or three weeks, he came down in the locker room to kind of view and take the temperature of the room as far as the players were concerned. Hey, and you guys, listen to me, man. Um, I'm looking at my comments, and I'm seeing some anti-Semitic things that I don't like. Please stop it. You know, either stop it or get off my podcast. But I'm not going to sit here and watch you guys make comments, you know, that are degrading, anti-Semitic, um, um, you know, prejudice, whatever it is. You know, take that crap somewhere else. We're here to talk about the Eagles. We're here to talk about football, not all that other nonsense. But you guys know who you are. Um, the benefit, you know, familiarity. You finally, you know, got, you know, the guy that you wanted. You're not getting disciples. You're not getting the branches. You're not even getting the leaves. You got your guy, Nick, Vic Fangio. Okay. You got the tree. Now let's see what happens. What does Nick, what does Vic Fangio bring to the table? He brings an authoritative figure on the defense. He's not going to take any shit. You bring a 37-year proven 
defensive veteran that will hold players accountable. Um, and you are you're able to keep in place the foundation and bones of your defense because you've been trying to emulate this guy for the last three years. Now, the negative about Vic Fangio to me is his philosophy. And I get it. I've seen the statistics where Miami finished and statistically what they do and how much better Miami was than we were as a defense. They have better players in the back half of the defense. That's the first point that I want to make. The other point that I want to make is that Philadelphia has historically been an aggressive style defensive city. We want to inflict pain. We want you to feel us. We want to make you fear us. And this philosophy that Vic Fangio is going to bring to the table, this bend but don't break style defense, okay? I can tell you now, he's going to be a little more aggressive than his predecessors, Jonathan Gannon and Sean Desai. But theoretically, the, the philosophy that he's going to bring to the table is still similar. They want to bend but don't break. They want to be more aggressive once teams get in the red zone. And they're going to keep playing their defensive backs off the, off the ball, you know, and giving up chunks of yardage. I'm sick and tired of seeing that. To me, that's not the way that you play defense. And maybe, I don't know, maybe the pass coordinators played that way because they just didn't feel like they had the personnel to get it done. But this is the philosophy that the Eagles organization has won it forever. They wanted Vic Fangio last year. But Jonathan Gannon playing his games and not really telling the Eagles what was going on, you know, Vic Fangio couldn't wait to after the Super Bowl. He had to take the job with Miami while it was available. But don't get it twisted at all. The Eagles wanted him, and he wanted to be the defensive coordinator, you know, going into this past season. So now they got it. And what I'll say is, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what this defense looks like when it's all said and done. I'm not a big believer in the Fangio. Respect the hell out of Vic Fangio and what he's been able to do. Was coaching way, way back when I was in the league. Um, so I have a ton of respect for the guy. I'm just not a fan of his philosophy on how you play defensive football and again this also falls into that lane of um dealing with howie roseman and how past success produces slow change listen when you when you're in the when you're in the playoffs three years in a row with a rookie head coach who's never been a head coach before okay and you get to the Super Bowl in year two. There's this mindset that we're doing things the right way. We're going to trust our process. You heard Harry Roseman say it yesterday. I read between the lines. I hear everything that people said. I understand coach speak, GM speak, all of those things. Okay. And this is the thing that scared me the most about Howie and Jeffrey is the fact that they've had success and he talked about Nick's record as the head coach as a reason why he felt as though it was necessary to bring Nick back. And I heard somebody on WIP today say, do you know how many teams out there would love to be in the position that the Eagles are in? The Chicago Bears. The Minnesota Vikings, the Arizona Cardinals, all these bad teams. To be honest with you, I don't give a rat's ass about either one of those teams. What I care about is this, this Philadelphia Eagles team. You know, that's what I care about. I care about those teams. 
because those teams will languish. You know, that's what they do. The Philadelphia Eagles have an opportunity to turn the corner and do something special. But I think sometimes you can get yourself caught up in a situation where you just, you have success, you fall in love with your process, you believe it's the right way, and you're not opening yourself up over time to looking at things in a proper way. When you have success, it's okay to follow that same path. But when you're not having success, or even if you have a slip of one year, you have to re-evaluate everything and ask yourself, is this the way that we should actually be going about this? Or is there a change necessary? And from what I heard from Harry Roseman yesterday, and I'm waiting to hear Jeffrey Lurie speak next month or when the new fiscal season starts, I hear we understand how to get it done because we've shown it over the last three years. Oh, Nick, Nick has a, you know, nine wins. Um, I forget last year how many wins they had. You know, to come back this year, they've got, um, you know, 11 wins. And then you ask yourself, yeah, you got 30 something wins. You're averaging about 10, 11 wins a year. That's true. But at the end of the day, isn't it about winning the Super Bowl? Yeah, you've been in the playoffs, but you know, do you count year one and year three when you got your asses railroaded out of the playoffs by the same team? And I'm not talking about competitively. No, you got ran up out of the playoffs in the first round. Year one, I get it. This year, unacceptable, in my opinion. Okay. So I'm going to give. I'm going to watch it all. I'm giving you guys my opinion about how I see it. My condemnation doesn't mean that Nick's going to fail or, you know, Vic Fangio and his, you know, defensive philosophy is going to fail. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Because the one thing I do know is that Harry Roseman is going to go to work. The one thing you can't question, you may, you may be able to question his ability to evaluate talent. You may question his ability to understand when's the right time to pull the plug on some older players because even after the first Super Bowl, he got in trouble bringing guys back longer than they need to be here. Do we know whether, you know, Fletcher Cox or Brandon Graham's coming back? I'm sure they both want to come back. question you have to ask yourself, is there enough productivity – to warrant bringing them back. And I love both of them. Love them to death. But you have to ask yourself those hard questions when things don't go right. Do we need upgrades at those positions? Can we increase the pro productivity at those positions if we decide to move on from those guys? How much money can we save on the cap if we move on from those guys? Let's jump over to the offensive coordinator and how Nick Sirianni handled that. When he was asked about it, they want to bring in some, uh, some a guy with some fresh ideas, a guy with an innovative mindset. They can have a system which they can incorporate and infuse into what they already do well. Sounds good. Sounds really good. Who is that guy? You want new wrinkles, you know, for the offense. Um, this is what I want. I want somebody who's going to come in and have the plan for how to handle the freaking blitz instead of lining up and having everybody run go routes. How about a better scheme? that utilizes all the talent that we have on offense. There's no way in hell that this offense shouldn't be scoring 30 to 40 points a game. They just got too many – they got too much talent, man. They should be leading the league in scoring every freaking year. There's just no if, ands, or buts about it. And I want to see a scheme that will utilize 
Dallas Goddard in the most proper way. I'm talking about just simple things. Like when you get in the red zone, where's the spit knob to the tight end? Every other offense in the National Football League has that play, except for the Eagles. How many seam routes have you seen Dallas Goddard run in the, in the red zone? Versus cover two, not a single one. I can't tell you how many times I had to cover that while I played, and I can't tell you how many times as I'm watching football on a week-to-week basis, I see other tight ends, George Kittle, um, 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 Travis Kelsey, all of these guys, the, the Laporte kid, the minute they get in the red zone, they dial up that play. But we don't have it. It's not in our playbook. We don't have plays for Dallas Goddard where you can feature him out of out of 12 personnel with bootlegs and misdirection plays. Come on. Everybody else has got that. That's what I want to see somebody who has the ability to utilize all the talent that we have on the offensive side of the ball. And don't get me wrong. A.J. Brown's a bad boy, but they got some talent at other positions on this offense that we have underutilized. And, yes, A.J. Brown is going to bitch and complain when you're not winning. But if you're winning, he has no grounds and no basis whatsoever to say a damn word if he ain't getting the ball every other play. So who is that going to be? We keep hearing these names. What's Cliff Cliff Kingsbury going to bring to the table? You got to throw some names out here because, you know, I'm just – I'm a little unnerved tonight. I can't even remember who the hell they – who the hell all that they 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 interviewed? I see some of you guys put down on it. Oh, you know we need to get um, Eric Bieniemy. They're not bringing Eric Bieniemy in here. You wonder why Eric Bieniemy, his his demeanor and the way he approaches things things are way too powerful and too strong for them. They got to have guys that they can control. When those players down in Washington started bitching and complaining in training camp, oh, he's too intense. He's too hard on us. I'm like, do y'all know that y'all suck? That y'all have sucked for the last 15 years. And you got a guy with multiple Super Bowls on his resume and you complaining? How about you go to work and earn your damn paycheck? Go to work and do what the coaches are asking you to do, and then you see the benefit of that. I don't know if you guys seen it. I have it on my Twitter page. So if you guys get a chance, go and look at it. I was not a Dan Campbell fan. That whole bite him him on the knee bullshit that he started off with, you know, in his first press conference. I'm like, oh, geez, here we go. And the false bravado just went on and on and on. And then I saw this video that came out this week that was on Hard Knocks, because I don't watch that stuff. When he was talking to his players, and he said, I know you guys think I'm crazy, because he had them in full pads, and I guess they were hitting that day. And that's become a no-no in the NFL. Go go figure, okay? He said, I know some of y'all are looking at me like I'm crazy. He said, but I need you guys to trust me, because the study said, that you need reps and you need intensity. And that's what's going to help us get to where we need to get to. When you're playing defense, what do you do? He said you pursue and you tackle. You pursue and you tackle. And I'm watching this and I'm like, see, this is it's a great lesson because for me, because this is why you don't prejudge somebody until you can see the whole picture. Okay, so then he goes, I need you guys to trust me. He said, only thing I think about is you guys. He got emotional, got very emotional. The only thing I think about is what's best, what's possible for you guys. He says, you got to, we got to hit and we got to prepare so that when we get in the season, we can do those things. You got to harden the body. You got some of you guys have heard me talk about. What is training camp for? Training camp 
is so that you get your body in shape for what you have to do during the season, okay? If I get hit on my forearm, yes, it's sore as hell in training camp, but then that, that where I hit it, it calluses. So when I hit you with that son of a gun during the season, it ain't going to be sore anymore. Why? Because I've hardened my body. I've galvanized my body to get ready for what the season will require. Why do so many guys get hurt in today's game? Because they don't do a damn thing in training camp. They don't tackle. They don't hit. They don't do anything. You walk through, you walk through, and walk through, and walk through all week, and then you expect to play at a high level on Sunday? The same way you walk through during the week, you're going to walk your ass through on Sunday. And that's what we what we watched for the last seven weeks of the season. We watched the football season as this team that started 10 and 1 walk through the remainder of the damn season. And then at the end, Dan says, I just need you guys to, to, to trust me. He's like, We're not gonna do this every day. But we need to do it. The study says we need to do it, and I'm gonna take care of you guys. Newfound respect for that guy. That was back in 2022. He has his team on the cusp of a Super Bowl after not even winning a playoff game in Detroit for 30 something years. Changed my perspective of the guy. Hell of a coach. Not only is he a player's coach, he knows how to motivate his guys. He knows how to talk to his guys and get them to understand what's necessary to win. So when I looked at that, that made me think of back about Sidney Brown saying, oh, when you don't practice intensely and you don't practice physically, you know, those things manifest in the game. This is a rookie talking. A couple of weeks ago. Then Javon Hargrave jumps on the boat. Oh, it's like country club over there in Philadelphia, but we work down here in San Francisco. I was shocked and surprised. It's like, you know, that, that's like the Eagles practice is like, you know, the, the Golden State Warriors. When we practice, it's like the Miami Heat. What is he saying? That's finesse over there. This is straight hardcore football right here. That's why we play hard. We play fast. We hit you in the mouth. We make you feel us. When was the last time we seen that out of Philadelphia Eagles football team? You don't. Because that's not their mindset. Their mindset is to be protective. Let's get the players to the regular season. No practice, no tackling in practice, no full speed, nothing. Come on, man. How do you expect the players to play at a high at a high level when you're practicing at the lowest level that you possibly can? You're trying to protect players. So now their mindset is, oh, I gotta, I, I, I want to stay, I gotta stay healthy. Let me tell you something. I had a coach, one of my coaches, way, 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 way back, even before I got to the National Football League. He said the quickest way to get injured is going half ass. He said, watch the tape. Most players, when they get hurt, they get hurt because they have asthma. They lallygagging and jogging to the play, and somebody clips them and they get hit. They get hurt or they're standing around the pile. He said, but the player that goes 100 miles an hour very, very rarely ever gets hurt, at least not to the level of the player that's half assed. Okay? So, newfound respect for damn. Dan Campbell, and congratulations, you know, for them accomplishing what they've accomplished. Okay. Um, my concern is how how do we get the Eagles to shift their perspective, to shift their mindset? And understand that, you know, the game has got to be played a different way. Even in the midst of you having the success that you had going to two Super Bowls in the last six years. Tom Brady threw 505 yards, Super Bowl 52. And Nick Foles had to orchestrate touchdown drives, damn them, every possession to make up for the difference. And Brandon Graham made the play of his career strip sack on Tom Brady, okay? At, when the game was over, Jim Schwartz didn't even want to talk about 505 yards. 
505 yards passing. I'm not saying 505 yards total offense. I'm saying 505 yards passing in one 60-minute football game, in a Super Bowl, no less. His theory was them, but don't break. Then we got Jonathan Gannon. We went to the Super Bowl last year, and in my opinion, that philosophy in the second half undid the chances of the team actually winning the Super Bowl because you couldn't get a rush with your four-man front. That meant you had to send some people. But that's not how they operated, and that's not what they believed in. So they just stayed the course, and Patrick Mahomes sliced and diced them, you know, for three touchdowns in the second half, and they lost the game by three points. And you fast forward to this year, you go and you bring in another Vic Fangio disciple. The whole Bimba don't break. How'd that work out? You got lucky through 11 games. But then when the bell tolled, everything went to hell in a handbasket. And teams had figured out how to beat you because you refused to be creative in your ways of actually you know, bringing pressure. It's not that Desai didn't bring pressure. It's just that when he decided to bring it, it was predictable. And teams knew how to pick it up. So when are we going to get back to being more aggressive? I think Vic Fangio will be. I just don't think that he'll be to the degree that he necessarily would be because that's not the philosophy that the Eagles believe in, that Howie Roseman and Jeffrey Lurie believe in. They believe in explosive plays on offense and containing the explosive plays on the defensive side of the ball. You can't protect anything in the game of football. The minute you go into protective mode is the minute you begin to lose. So that mentality, in my opinion, has to change. Okay, lastly, let's jump into some Howie Roseman. I think that Howie was starting to feel a little bit of the heat yesterday. You can kind of see it. Oh, by the way, um, you're watching Seth Jordan podcast presented to you by Bet Parks. Uh, make sure you guys, you know, listen, it's been a phenomenal year. I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, the likes, please hit that like button. Um, you know, love the comments. Comments have been off the charts all season long. Um, and, and, of course, you know, you guys have brought my subscribership up tremendously, and I would – you know, ask that you continue to do that. All right. I, I thank you. Um, hi, Rose. I think a little bit of the heat is on um, as far as he's concerned. The, the, the things that I'm confident in Howie Roseman in is his ability to be a magician with the salary cap, to make trades, to, to gain draft capital. Um, to manipulate the cap in a way that allows this football team to continue to be competitive. And there's no doubt in my mind that he'll continue to do that. My greatest question mark for Harry Roseman is his ability to evaluate and, and, and pick and bring talent to this football team. And because of how they've structured things and their ability to go out and bring coaches in, their ability to build staffs that allow the coaches, coaches who have true ability, to actually help your players get better. I just looked over here and I saw, um, you know, you guys appreciate you guys helping me out with some of the potential. Um, Quarterback. So before I jump totally into Howie, you know, I want to look at some of these guys. You, listen, Cliff Kingsbury has never been a winner ever, anywhere he's been. He was at um, Texas Tech, never won. Took over at Arizona, you know, never won. Had a team that, similar to what the Eagles did this year. They went, you know, something like 10 and 2, and the bottom fell out at the end of the season. You know, got railroaded out of the playoffs the first the first game. Had a quarterback, a young quarterback who just totally disrespected him. You know, so I'm not so sure that that's the fit. Kellen Moore, 
Kellen Moore, you know, did some really good things with Dak Prescott, but I think at the end of the day, the inability to run the football actually did him in in doubt. He's another one of those guys, similar to, you know, what the Eagles do from time to time. That, and that may that might be what's so attractive about him, is that what they do is, you know, they will fall in love with the passing game in a very unproductive way. And that's what really ran Kellen Moore out of Dallas is the fact that they didn't run it enough. The fact that you're asking Dak Prescott to put the ball in the air 40 plus times on a regular basis, is that what we want? Is that what we want for a Jalen Hurst that's looking to bounce back, the guy that we think can be the franchise? Eric Bieniemy is going to coach these guys hard, and they're going to, he's going to hold them accountable. And maybe because of, you know, how Chip Kelly handled everything, he screwed that up for any kind of coach who can be that way. I don't know. We'll see. And and and, and will Eric Bieniemy be such a strong personality that he becomes a guy, you know, that threatens Nick Sirianni or threatens Howie Roseman? If that's the case, he certainly can't be – you know, the offensive coordinator for these Philadelphia Eagles. I can promise you that. So I'm waiting with bated breath, just like you guys are, to kind of figure out, you know, who's going to be the offensive guru that's going to help turn this situation around and figure it out. Um, they're locked in on <laughs> Big Fangio. I surely, you know, wish that Wink Martindale would have been the guy. I really do. But they've been in love with Vic Fangio forever. And now they finally got a chance to get their guy. So Harry Roseman. Um, I talked about it earlier. You know, past successes is going to make it very, very hard, you know, for them to produce changes because they think that they're doing it right. They believe that they're doing it right. It's going to be really hard um, for them to admit that they've been doing it wrong and make the records of changes to change it over. Um, the other thing, he, he talked yesterday, how he did, about, you know, someone asked him about linebackers and safeties and their philosophy on those positions. And he, his, his answer was, I mean, blew, another thing just blew me away. It wasn't so much of what we didn't do as it was, my confidence in the guys that we had in the building. Come on. Come on. You know, I was born tonight, but not last, not, not last night. There is no way in hell that you can tell me that Howie Roseman looked at Zach Cunningham, Nicholas Morrow, who they actually cut in training camp, and had and and, and Nicole Dean, who was yet to prove him that he's the NFL. Linebacker, you can't tell me that you looked at those guys and you had supreme confidence in what they were bringing to the table. He says, we still believe in the Kobe Dean. Dude, and let, me, let me tell you something. This is my thought on the Kobe Dean. I think the Kobe Dean is a guy that benefited from playing in front of one of the best defensive lines in college that college football potentially has ever seen. They played a lot of five-man front, which made him a one-gap player. And they protected him. And he could just run to the ball and make tackles. It's the same exact thing I see in a lot of ways with what they're trying to do here. But in the four-man line where he's got to take on offensive linemen and shed blocks and get – he is a liability. I just – I did not realize how small he is in comparison to all the other players on the field. He looks like a little child on the field playing with grown men. And you wonder why he continues to get hurt because he's too small. And when you're fighting guys that are, you know, that you're giving away 100 pounds to, if he's 130 pounds, let's just say 120 to 130 pounds, that means offensive line, 200, I should say, excuse me. Offensive linemen are checking in at 310, 315, 320, 330. 
and you at 200 and 25 to 230 pounds, you mean to tell me that you're going to battle those guys on a on a play-to-play -play basis? It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. After he came back off of injury, the first time he got hurt, the first game he had 12 tackles, and they raved about, oh, he had 12 tackles. He had a hell of a game. What they didn't tell you, because he was making those tackles five, six yards downfield. He wasn't making tackles for, for losses. He had one or two plays, you know, where he shot a gap and guessed right and got in the backfield and made a tackle. But for the most part, people, he was making tackles four, five, six yards down the field. You can't play linebacker in the, in the National Football League like that. So how is reluctance? understand that that position is under talented that you need when was the question when was the last time when was the last time that we have a difference maker at safety Malcolm Butler I mean Malcolm Jenkins okay when was the last time we had a linebacker of any substance I can't even think of a playmaker at linebacker position that we've had since Jeremiah Trot. Now you guys know how far back that goes, okay? The problem with this defense is on the back end, we don't have enough playmakers. You put all the money on the defensive side of the football into the defensive line, and you are requiring the defensive line to take up the slack for the, the entire back seven or six. It makes no sense. T.J. Edwards cost the Chicago Bears 19.5 million bucks, something around there. That comes out to about 6.2, 6.3, you know, a year. Do you want to know what the Eagles spent on the entire, the entire linebacker core last year? Six million dollars for the entire linebacker core. But TJ Edwards went to the Chicago Bears and got six million dollars for one year. So they paid the same amount for four or five linebackers that they paid, Chicago paid for one. You want to wonder, you, and you want to know why the defense is struggling? They're going to continue to struggle because you can have everything that you want up front, but if you don't have playmakers on the back end, th there's no synergy between the two, and you can't keep playing these guys ten yards off the ball and think that the pass rush is going to get there. Doesn't work that way. It worked for you last year. But it didn't work for you this year. And you kept doing the same thing over and over and over again. You've got to have playmakers at the linebacker position. Look at the teams that are left in the, in the chase. The teams that are left in the chase, look at their defenses. Their defenses have playmaking linebackers. San Francisco, Baltimore, the Anzalone kid for Detroit. Kansas City, the Bolton, and Gay Kid. All these other teams have got linebackers that are playmakers and difference makers. And we keep trying to take linebackers that have been perennial special teams players, converted safeties to linebackers, and try to plug them in and make it work. So I'm not buying that BS, Howie that you had the ultimate confidence in a guy like Nicholas Morrow and a guy like Nicobe Dean and a guy like, you know, Zach Cunningham. I call BS. Your philosophy is not to spend the money at the position. All you got to look at is how much money they actually spent at the position. If you had six linebackers on the on the roster, you basically spent a million dollars per linebacker. 
safety. How long are we going to keep trading for guys instead of going out and drafting the players and developing? And when I talked about the coaching staff and their inability to, 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 to develop talent, this is what comes, this, this is what it comes to. It comes to this because if you don't have coaches that can actually teach and, and, and not just teach, but develop and give players a toolbox that they can operate out of, how are they supposed to get better? When was the last time we drafted a cornerback in development? When was the last time we drafted a linebacker in development? When was the last time we drafted a safety in development? You see the pattern. He hit the home run back in 2017 because every free agent acts, um, um, every free agent that he acquired, he hit. Patrick Robinson hit. Malcolm Jenkins hit. Nigel Bradham hit. All of these players came from someplace else, and I know I'm missing a bunch of others. All of those players, Alshon Jeffrey hit. All these players came from somebody, somewhere else, already developed, already with a skill set, and you plug them in. When you tried that this year, it didn't work. It fell apart. So the foundation of your football team, I see you, Torrey Smith. The foundation of your football team is, is the players that you draft. And while the defense and the offensive front and the quarterback and the wide receiver is important, there's other places and other positions that are important too. And if you don't figure out how to draft better and how to evaluate players better and understand that you're going to have to spend, you're going to have to allocate some of that money in the salary cap to some other players and other positions, particularly at the safety and at the linebacker position. We got two cornerbacks on this team. One came to us via a trade. The other guy came to us, you know, via free agency. How many linebackers, how many cornerbacks have we drafted and developed? You go out and you hire these coaches, these head coaches who have very little experience and they're hiring their friends and they're hiring, um, you know, their, their peers. They come in here and they don't have the ability to teach and develop and 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 give and give the skill sets that are necessary for players to get better. And then you know you kind of wonder why things why we're always a team in flux. And don't get me wrong, like I said, my confidence is in Howie. As far as you know, what he's going to do, I know he's going to attack the offseason. He's going to aggressively attack the offseason because I think he's feeling just as much heat as Nick Sirianni is at this point in time. Because he knows that, like I said earlier, this window for this football team can close extremely quickly if the Philadelphia Eagles and Howard Rosen don't figure out how to right this shit pretty soon. All right. Once again, you guys are listen, listening to the Seth Joyner Show. I appreciate you guys. I'm liking, love the comments. Uh, please share and subscribe to Seth Joyner um, Show on YouTube. Um, I'll be around kicking it to you guys as things continue to develop. Still waiting on the offensive coordinator. Still waiting on which coaches are going to be, you know, filling in where, which defensive coaches are going to stay and which ones are leaving. Um, Still, there's a lot to get done. So I'll be right here with you guys, you know, until they get it done. Um, and then you guys know I always got to take me a little vacation, you know, for a couple of weeks, but then I'll be back. Right. Anyway, we've got the NFC, the AFC, and NFC matchups this week. We've got the Kansas City Chiefs traveling to the Baltimore Ravens. Um, and here are my keys, man. Um, but Kansas City, I think I can't wait for this matchup, man. Kelsey, Travis Kelsey against Kyle Hamilton. 
I right, listen, man. That this this is the old fashioned finesse team against the Smash Mouth team, and I'm picking um, the Ravens in this game because I think that they're the the best and most well rounded football team in the National Football League. Um, for the Chiefs, that key matchup is going to be Hamilton. Kyle Hamilton against Travis Kelsey. Um, how the Ravens will handle the Pacheco running attack because it plays a large part in what they do offensively. And then Mahomes is, you know, second biggest target is this Rasheed Rice kid who has emerged over the last couple of weeks and whether they'll have the ability to limit him. Because if they can limit him and apply the resources to, you know, Kyle Hamilton from time to time, double and take Kelsey out of the game, I think Patrick Mahomes is going to have a tough day. Um, the Baltimore Ravens know that they're going to have to keep Patrick Mahomes in the pocket because, I'm, in my opinion, he's more dangerous when he's out of the pocket than when he's in. So I'm not sure whether that looks like a spy or whether it looks like, you know, a slower rush that doesn't allow him the lanes to actually get out. Um, but it would be to his benefit to figure out a way to get on the move. For the Ravens, hey, listen, you know, they're going to be physical. They're going to run the ball. Um, they're going to pound on this defense. They're going to force – Steve Spagnuolo to just, you know, commit more guys to the box than he really wants to. Um, the other thing is he's going to be trying to figure out, you know, how how to keep Lamar Jackson in the pocket because similar to, you know, even a step above, you know, a Patrick Mahomes, Lamar is just twice as, as dangerous because the first thing is, if you're going to play man against them, that's where he's most dangerous. That's where you really got to keep him in the pocket because most of these guys are running downfield. Defenders are running down the field with their backs to the play, and they're understanding that, hey, <laughs> the only guys that can see him is either the, the single or the double high safety. So he's going to get 15, 20 yards before the defense can even react to it. So it's going to be imperative for them to come up with a way to keep him in the pocket and make him operate and throw the ball from the pocket. Big, you know, got Andrews coming back. Um, another weapon to throw into Lamar's arsenal. He's become much more proficient at throwing the football from the pocket. Love seeing it. Um, the Ravens got to stay out of third down situations because one thing that, that Steve Spagnuolo is, he likes to get people in situations where you lose on first down, force you to throw it on second down, incomplete, and then come after you, or even come after you on second down to try to push you in a third and really long. So it's going to be really important for Baltimore to win first down. And, you know, most of all, just be physical. Kansas City doesn't like that kind of physicality. They're a finesse football team, and finesse football teams, they just want to dance around you. They want to play basketball on grass. <laughs> At least that's what that's what Patrick Queen said. He said, but we don't play like that. We play a brand of football that most people don't like to play. We're going to hit you in the mouth. Ooh, oh, my God. Love that. Love that. Taking the Ravens. I ain't giving you guys a score until the end of the week. Then you got the Lions versus the 49ers. Let's start off with the Lions. What a story. What a story. I already talked to you guys about, you know, how I've done a 360 on Dan Campbell and what he's done with this football team. Um, you know, Jared Goff, he for him is going to be, you know, winning first down because if you get him in third and long, um, now you turn loose that 49ers pass rush. And if they can get pressure on him, he is one quarterback that is pressure adverse. He really crumbles under the pressure. That's why I was like blown away and shocked that Todd Bowles didn't come after him in the same manner that he came after 
Jalen Hurts the week early. Um, it's going to be interesting because, you know, the Lions can run the football, and it's a big part of what they do. Um, and they're going to have to take advantage on the outside. I think the places where you can really make hay against um, this 49ers defense is on the outside against their cornerback. And I think that the Lions are equipped to actually do that. Um, defensively, you know, I think they're going to have to be physical with the wide receivers and um, particularly a wide receiver, um, Brandon IU, because, listen, Brock Purdy is a good quarterback. I don't know why everybody's hating him. He runs the system that he's in and he's proficient at, it, especially when they can run the football, okay? Um, he throws the ball with timing and rhythm. And one thing that I saw, I think in week 15 or 16, a guy dropped, and before he got to the five-yard mark, he kind of gave the tight end an elbow and kind of threw him off balance a little bit. So with Brock Purdy throwing the ball to a spot on the field and trying to throw it with time and the rhythm, he let the ball go, and because of the shot, because of the bump, he wasn't, you know, Kittles wasn't where he was supposed to be when he was supposed to be there. So the Lions have got to be physical with these wide receivers to slow them up and break the timing and the rhythm of the 49ers passing game. And if they can do that, you know, they can neutralize Brock Purdy in a lot of ways. They don't have to pick their spots when to come after him and when not. The 49ers, you know, we, we, we know, you know, the keys for the 49ers. That all revolves around whether Debo Samuels will be ready to go. I believe that he will. The interchangeability that you have between he and Christian McCaffrey. Christian McCaffrey is really, you know, the spoon that stirs the coffee because when they're running the ball good, now they play action pass and misdirection and bootlegs, all of those things come into focus and they're hard to stop when they're operating like that. You know, Debo Samuels, line him up in the backfield, hand him the ball like a running back. You know, you can take Christian McCaffrey and put him out in the slot, you know, Debo's position. And then obviously, you know, you got Kittle doing what he's doing, you know, threatening the linebackers. But Brandon Ayuk, he's the guy that's going to run those deep 15-yard in routes and those slant routes. And if at some point in time the Lions defense doesn't get to a place where they begin to challenge the inside half of the wide receiver rather than playing outside man coverage all the time, that's an easy pitch and catch for a guy like Brock Purdy. All that being said, the Lions won their first playoff game in 30-plus years two weeks ago. I like the Lions in this game. I think they go into San Francisco with a good plan to beat them, and I've got the Baltimore Ravens facing the Detroit Lions in Super Bowl 58 in February. All right. Hey, guys, that's the show for tonight. Um, I'll be back next week. We'll have some more information about the Eagles and where they're headed, along with, by that time, we'll know who's headed to, to the Super Bowl in Las Vegas. All right? So I'm going to wrap right there. As always, you guys take care of each other and be good to each other, but most importantly, Make sure you love each other. I'll see you right back here next week. Same place, same time. Peace.